last night we were we had a gathering and Joe had said he was just going back six months ago, a couple years ago, and and uh, three years ago, and and you know it hit. Uh, I get people all the time that'll ask me, "Do you want to return to law enforcement? Do you wish you had not left law enforcement?" And and I I never regretted it. Uh, I didn't because the Lord told me to retire, and I did. And then, uh, well, do you like living in Texas? We just got a star on our fence, and I'm so proud of that star. And are you glad you left Louisiana to come to Texas? I really, truly am. We followed the Lord. And, and just the reality, <clears throat> and, I'm, and I'm not saying this to take credit. I'm just trying to put my words in a, uh, I'm just trying to process something, um, what I'm feeling. But we've all had those moments. Um, I realized that if 10 years ago I'd not said yes, just yes, but I would not know any of you. Most of us would not know each other. <clears throat> and, and it's not because of me. Um, I just want to show you that, that God's return on obedience never ends. Amen. Amen. A simple yes. Yeah. Yes, I will retire. Yes, I will leave my hometown. Yes, I will move to a place that I've never been before. Yes, we will do ministry in our house and let 200 people a week destroy it. Yes, we will plant a church. Yes, we will move to Midlothian. Um, it's a little overwhelming. The power of a simple yes to the Lord's calling. I want to encourage you in those times of doubt when the natural economy doesn't make sense. You may not understand the supernatural significance of it all. Simply say yes. We don't have to know all the details. Like this. This is good. Amen. So thank you. Amen. We do appreciate being appreciated. Amen. It makes us uncomfortable. But like, like blessing people, uh, we would never block a blessing. So thank you. So let's get into the word today. It is a good word. Um, we're back in the Gospel of Mark. You know, it's so fitting as the Elder Scott is, is sharing, uh, leading us through the observation of communion, that what we're going to talk about today is literally uh, about 48 hours at the most away from, from this, uh, when Jesus gives the instruction for communion. Uh, we are literally walking through the last week of Jesus' life on earth. So, you know, I'll just recap the tithing and giving series. Uh, it really was. It was about relationship through a reverent fear of our holy God. I want to share the, the word, the revelation that, that broke uh, the series and broke the fast. It, it comes from Acts 5, 11, 12, and I shared this last week. Um, so, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things, continuing power in the church. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Remember, Solomon's porch is a section outside the temple. It was the church. It's where they gathered. But I wanted to show you that when I was preparing for last week's message, the Holy Spirit gave me this as the last section of our three-week teaching on tithe and giving. But it comes down to a holy fear. I'm going to say it so I don't have to say it the rest of the message. Jesus is not your boyfriend. It's not about warm and fuzzy emotions. It is the Lord demands reverent fear. He is a holy God set apart. And in the new church, when holy fear came upon the body, they didn't scatter. <clears throat> Power continued through the church. Continued. I will remind you that God moves in atmospheres of holy, reverent fear of the Lord. You're missing a little zing in your, in your faith walk? This is a good opportunity. Are you approaching your relationship with the Lord in fear? And I don't mean being afraid unless you're, you're sinning, then you should be afraid, but you can repent and come back. But I'm talking reverent fear, respect, awe of a holy God. Don't treat him like he's every day. Don't treat him normal. So that whole series, that was a word from the Lord. That was to teach us as believers in the corporate body that we've got to gain an eternal perspective on everything from the tithe to salvation. 
this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about putting on your God goggles and gaining a biblical worldview. What I will tell you is you will never, ever, ever see the world the same way again. The one thing that the Lord put on my heart for this message today is prophecies are, are like seeds of future truth planted that once blossomed reveal Jesus' divinity. And why is this important to you? Well, prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit. You can minister the prophetic and you can be ministered to in the prophetic. We've got three solid, trusted prophets of the house. We've got other folks <clears throat> that have been called into, uh, into, into a ministry of prophetic. But I am telling you that the Lord has given us prophecy as a gift to edify the body. I'm going to show you that Jesus, the prophet, uses prophecy so to reveal himself in the divine. So our anchor scripture for today, and it's, it's Mark 13, 1, 2, like two lines of scripture. We could spend a month here, but let's stand together because every word matters, as Elder Scott uh, illustrated in, the, in, the, uh, in his communion. So let's read this together. This is from Mark 13, 1, 2. Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. And let's read together. Then, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. That is a good word. That is a good word. I want to tell you that, that prophecy stretches your vision. You see, Jesus regularly made prophetic declarations leading up to his crucifixion. Like prophecy grows the hearer's faith in God and his eternal word, and it promotes a desire for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Like, like today, we're going to talk about gaining an eternal perspective, changing your worldview, the way you see things. Like, if we're being honest, we will get so excited when somebody uh, predicts a sports score. Not the over-under, but I mean the score. But we fail to bank our faith on the eternal things above. You see, how do we look beyond the chaos of a crumbling world? It's so easy to get locked in to the, to the what's going on. We're about two weeks away from a, from a very important election cycle. It is so easy to get locked into the chaos and the propaganda. So how do we look beyond that? How do we keep an eternal perspective? It's by elevating your vision. I am challenging you to learn to put on your God goggles in your life so you see Christ through his eyes. You see God the way God wants to be seen. We do this, Colossians tells us 3, 1, uh, 2. It's about not carnality, but Christ. If then you were raised in Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. It's okay to be aware of what's going on, but we can't become a part or a victim of the going ons. We've got to learn to keep an eternal perspective. So I want to I bring you up to speed. Like I said, we are chronologically in the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Um, Teaching-wise, it will probably take us a good six months to walk through the entirety of this. So it's important to always remember where we're at, where we're heading. You see, today what we're going to do is we're going to join Jesus as he sits on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple. But I want you to remember, again, it's so important that this is Jesus' last chronological week on his life on earth. Like, his mission is to reveal himself during this week. He is no more, they're called the Davidic secret, when he would heal somebody. Hey, but don't tell nobody. Because at the time, it wasn't time. Now's the time to reveal who he is. He is the prophesied Messiah. I will tell you that his life fulfilled anywhere from 400 to uh, over 500 and something 
prophecies from the Old Testament. You can Google, there is no other major religion, ma religion that has ever been in existence that has the fulfillment of so many prophecies. Prophecy, what it does, it builds a sense of anticipation in God's coming glory. And it gives affirmation of faith when the event comes to pass. I will tell you, if every Sunday you're not running up here to grab the $90, to grab the ministry from a prophet, you're missing out. You're missing out. It is a gift from God. They have been giving, given a gift from God. And they have said yes to receiving the gift from God. I will tell you, if you've ever received a prophetic word, it builds anticipation and excitement. And then when the event comes to pass, it gives affirmation that God's word's good. I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to, to partake of the gift of the prophets. We all also have the gift of prophecy through the Holy Spirit. So back to Jesus, the prophet. He's had a busy week, I think, if we can all say. This is a critical time in Jesus' life. I want to make sure that we're up to speed on the events. We also, we traditionally call this Holy Week. What I encourage you is to go back and read Mark, the cha chapters 11 and 12. Also, if you go to the website or you go to the YouTube channel, all the teachings uh, from Mark 11 and 12, actually all the teachings from the day we started uh, but on there, but particularly take the time because we took a three-week pause to go, to go to that other lesson um, on the website and on YouTube. The, every message from chapters 11 and 12 are there. I encourage you to, to get caught up, to stay current in where we're at. So just to summarize, if we remember, we came back after our Summer of Love marriage series. Uh, we started Palm Sunday when Jesus arrived on a cult. Uh, and, and we moved through that to where he had all those debates with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin Council, um, the Herodians and even the scribes. We went through all that, even to the point where he watched the widow give from her whole livelihood. And now Jesus has been nonstop towards his rescue mission. Jesus is singularly focused. I tell you, on well, my SWAT days, we did a hostage rescue. We didn't bother telling nobody to get on the ground. We were singularly focused on the rescue. Jesus is singularly focused on your rescue. This is what he's doing. And it brings us here today as he exits the temple. Like, like let's just, let's be real <clears throat> for a moment. Just think. Put yourself in Jesus' sandals. All the controversy, all the challenges, all the disrespect that he's put up with, just standing in the temple trying to teach the truth of the word. It didn't stop. It was relentless. This is what Leah calls, I'm peopled out. She gets to a point, she's an introvert, and she goes, I'm peopled out. And physically, she cannot even force another word or coherent thought to come out of her head. I get it. This has got to be close to where Jesus is. One after another after another. And look, they're not just trying to get information or a soundbite from him. They are trying to find something to conflict, to bring him to crucifixion, to bring him to execution. They've got a, they've got a situation in their mind. They're, they've got to kill Jesus. They've got to kill him. But they don't have the authority. The Roman government will give them the authority. But they've got to bring even trumped up charges, you see. They're not just trying to win an argument. They're trying to put him to death. If you can, we've had days similar to that. I wouldn't say days like that. But when it just doesn't stop. This is where Jesus is. Jesus is carrying the weight of destiny. He's carrying the weight of his calling. Jesus has the character to carry that calling, but it doesn't make it any less heavy to carry. You know, I want to encourage you as an equipping moment. You too are people of destiny. You too carry the stain, the mark, the calling of God on your life. You too must continue to, to build your character to where you can carry that calling in your life. The weight of that calling doesn't crumble you but like, like a house of cards. You grow in your tensile strength. This is what we're called to do. 
God's got a calling for you. It's not meant to crush you. If you feel like you've been in obscurity or wilderness, or what's he waiting for? He's waiting for you to build your character to carry the calling. So I challenge you to continue to press into the Word, to press into the gifts. Like, like I say, like, what do you do when you just don't feel like doing it? Like when you don't feel like loving your neighbor? What do you do when you don't feel like serving at church? What do you do when you don't feel like waving back at your pastor at the gym? I'm not calling anybody out. But you know what you do? You do it the way Jesus did it. John 6, 38 tells us, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is how you do the things. When you don't feel like coming on Sunday. When you don't feel like loving your neighbor. You're not doing it out of your own desire. You're doing it out of God's will. You see, this is why Jesus was willing to hang on the cross. He didn't come looking forward to that. He came to do His Father's will. This has got to be the only reason that you are willing to pick up your cross. I guarantee you, we've all been through those times. I'm going to be good because I've been bad. I want, to, I want to be good to my wife. I want to be good to my kids. I want to be good to my parents. I'm going to be good. Wanting to be good is not the reason to carry your cross. Doing the Father's will. You cannot perform. Doing the Father's will is not doing it for your spouse or your kids or for puppies. Doing the Father's will gives you an eternal perspective. And it is only gained by doing God's will. So let's get into our anchor scripture. We're going to start Mark 13, 1. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what building uh, are here. This is another equipping moment. Jesus is exhausted. He is flat exhausted. He is burdened by the realities of what's to come. You just got off of work. You just want to sit in that chair and go to sleep. And your spouse hadn't seen you all day. This is when you've got to, you've got to press into the will of the Father. His disciple simply makes a comment. He's offering a thought on what a, what a beautiful building that is. But you know what, Jesus? Jesus doesn't neglect them or just placate. Yeah, 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 yeah. He uses it as an opportunity to reveal the kingdom of God. When the men and the women were doing our different discipleship uh, meetings with our disciples, and, and, and nothing is about just getting coffee. Nothing is about just what happened in your day. It always goes back through Scripture. It always is about revealing God to the person that we're talking to. So Jesus could have been like, yeah, the temple's cool and all. I dig it. I dig it. I really do. It's nice. But what does he do? He takes the opportunity, no matter what burden he's carried, to, to turn it back to the Father. You see, in our lives as believers, a day at work should never, ever just be a day at work. A text message or a social media post should never just be a text message or a social media post. A day lived in your life should never just be a day lived in your life. Like God gives us crazy amounts of opportunities to share His kingdom. To share His kingdom and His glory in every moment of our lives. Take every moment that may seem monotonous. That somebody may not even realize they're stepping into a season, an opportunity of destiny to be redirected to the Father. Every day of our life as a believer has got to be spent doing the will of the Father. Yes, See what that does? That gives your life identity and purpose and significance and security. You turn every text message, not into a sermon, but an opportunity to affirm or correct or flip the script back on the Father, then every text message becomes a message of purpose. Now, if you've got somebody aggravating you with text messages and you keep flipping the script back to Jesus, they'll quit text messaging you. Or they'll come, into, they'll come into righteousness. 
But I just wanna, I wanna challenge you to look for those opportunities to be the same person that somebody was to you before you came to know the Lord. We're all here because of somebody else. I want to share with you Matthew 28, 19, 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. Like Elder Scott said, even until the end of the age. Amen. What I share with you is if not us, who? If we do not share the gospel to a lost and dying world, who will? So it's a matter of perspective. Let's continue. Mark 13, uh, 1, I've referenced. As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, and I bolded, look at those magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones in the walls. I want to ask you, was Jesus impressed by the building? Now, from historical accounts, the temple was, a, was pretty amazing. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I asked Ellie, I said, can you find a picture of the temple? She goes, no, <laughs> it's been destroyed. So I said, find an illustration. But you know, from historical accounts, it was pretty amazing. It was, it's called the second temple. It was originally built by Zerubbabel after, uh, at a governor after he was appointed by the Persian king Cyrus the Great. It was uh, around 515 B.C. And I'm going to tell you, it was pretty amazing. It was built with these enormous stones. Some weighed over 100 tons. The, the cutting of the stones was so precise, they didn't use mortar. The precision was amazing. The much of the exterior, it was covered in gold, so it could be seen for miles. And, and the campus grounds, uh, the temple campus, it covered over 35 acres. That's pretty amazing. They didn't have CAD. They didn't have, a, they didn't have a computer like when most of us were in school. Our kids were like, you didn't have a computer? No, there was no CAD. There was no drawings. It's pretty amazing. So this disciple... It's okay that he was in awe of the temple. It is pretty amazing. But Jesus must have been impressed too, right? Well, I will tell you no. You see, the disciples only saw through the natural realm because they were focused on what man created. You see, Jesus sees the supernatural elements of all things. Why? Well, because his, God, his Father owns it all. His Father owns it all. Psalm 24, tell, 24 1 tells us, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. Like, why is it so important for you to understand and to see things through God's goggles? Why is it so important for you not to be impressed by this temple building that man built? Why is it so important? Well, first off, because God owns it all. Second, God gave it all to you. God's given everything to you. Genesis 1, 26, 28. And we've read this a lot over the last month, but I want you to just take a moment. Let the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord saturate your spirit to empower your soul, to put your body into action, to become good stewards of all that God's given you. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. In case you've missed one of the million times I've said it, male and female, there's only two, male and female, because God created them. Anything counterfeit is the devil. Um, doesn't mean we love them any less. We've got to pray for folks. Um, we've got to deliver them. But he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on earth. Gaining an eternal perspective grows you beyond worrying about a utility bill. 
and instead glorifying God because the bill for your sins have been paid in full. This is the difference between putting on your God goggles and seeing things only in the natural realm. You see, this is what God goggles helps you to see. Prophecy sharpens that vision. You see, Jesus understands the difference between the temporary and the eternal realms. Jesus came, placed himself in a very temporary role so that you could have everlasting life in an eternal spiritual realm. You see, what the, what the disciples are marveling at, they are incredible feats of architecture. But Jesus sees them as just mere rubble because he knows what waits ahead. Because he came to do the Father's will. Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Everything that we know, everything that we know will pass away. It will all pass away. So what do you see? Well, it depends on your perspective. It depends on your perspective. What I will challenge you is let's take a peek and see what Jesus gets to look at from Revelations 21, 1, 2. Now this is John when he says, Now I, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. This is passing away. Also, there was no sea. This is not illustrative or, or metaphorical. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The city of New Jerusalem is coming to be established on earth. It is so important that we gain an eternal perspective, that we look above the things, our situation now, and realize what's to come. We have the authority to drag heaven down to earth. So what does it look like compared to man's constructed temple? I want to give you the, an illustrative example, a tangible example. What I would challenge you, it's a lot of scripture, but in your own time this week, I want you to read Revelation 21-22. Read both chapters. I want you to get a, <clears throat> a, an exact example of what's waiting for us. Now, I do want to highlight from Revelation 21, uh, 16 through 18 I picked out spots. It's New Jerusalem. This city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furloughs. Then he measured its wall, 140 cubits. The construction of its walls was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Now, when I tell you that the kingdom of heaven is a system of governance and rules and structure, this, the new Jerusalem has measurements. If you're looking to order you some furniture from Wayfair for that time, you can, you can use these measurements. Uh, I always tell Leah, measure twice, cut once, um, as she's put all the stuff together in our house, and she does well with it. But I want you to fully realize that this is not some metaphorical pie in the sky. The kingdom of heaven is a governance there's rules, there's structure, there's order. If you're waiting for a blessing because you're just a pretty good person, that's not how God operates. It's not how God operates. There's structure and there's order. Not to suppress your joy, but to give you security and significance within that structure. You see, man's temple, it had those big carved stones. A hundred tons of stone, so precise in the cutting that they didn't have to use mud or mortar or anything. They fit perfect. A 35-acre complex covered in gold. But you know what was on the inside of that temple? Corrupt money changers. Defective sacrifices. You know what was in the inside of man, that temple? It was man's religion. It was man's tradition. So if Jesus wasn't overly excited, I get it. Because this is what Jesus is looking at. When we're talking about God's tabernacle, it said the walls, they were 216 feet high. They're not covered in stones. They are made of precious jewels. The walls around the city, when it talked about 12,000 furloughs, so I converted that to square feet, and then out of that I converted that to square miles. We're talking about 
2,250,000 square miles. This is New Jerusalem. I want to give you a perspective relative. This is what Jesus is looking at at the temple. This is what Jesus sees through his God goggles as New Jerusalem. How many cities, how many New York cities would fit inside of this? These are questions I ask. 7,437 New York cities would fit within the confines of New Jerusalem. Can you realize now why Jesus wasn't so overly impressed with man-made tabernacle? Do you see why we should not be so overly impressed by entertainers and athletes? So how many people? Well, as of October 2024, the global population was 8.18 billion people. You multiply that times 160 people. We are talking about I don't even know what that number is. Um, Well, let me see. Okay. It is 1,310,000,000, right? 400, I don't know. Hey, y'all, there's going to be a lot of us. (laughs) There's going to be a lot of us. Let me ask you a question. Should Jesus have been in awe of that man-made temple? Should we? No. Should we be in awe of athletes and entertainers? How about celebrity pastors? Come on. Come on. Come on. Unless you put on God goggles, you will. Unless you gain an eternal perspective, you're going to be oohing and on. Now, there's nothing wrong with appreciating a high-level athlete or a highly skilled entertainer or a pastor who is completely submitted and yielded to the Lord. But you will only see that when you're looking through perspective of God goggles. So, uh, Mark 13, 2. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? In the Greek, do you see? Is the Greek word blipo. It means to discern mentally, to perceive, to guard against. What is Jesus telling them? Renew your mind. Renew your mind. He's not saying, hey, y'all, check it out. What he's doing is, see, blipo, renew your mind. Do not be so impressed with the things of this world. What he's telling them, put on your God goggles. I want you to see beyond the surface of those carved stones. I want you to renew your mind to the things of this world. I want you to get past the fascination of man. When he says great buildings, in the Greek, it's okiodome. It means a spiritual structure, religious advancement. What is he telling these disciples? That temple, those great walls, that building, what he's saying is in the Greek, it means it represents man's religion, not God's relationship. He's saying by you obsessing over that, you're locking yourself into man's religion. You're missing out on God's relationship. Because you're not looking from an eternal perspective through God's goggles. When he says, not one stone shall be left upon another, that shall not be thrown down. In the Greek, shall be left. It's a femi. It means it implies abandonment or release. Jesus is prophetically declaring the total demolition of the temple. It's God's divine judgment, and it's going to signal the end of an error. The practice of physically coming to a physical temple to encounter the presence of God is coming to an end soon. Why? Because God's going to reside in us. Because God does reside in us. God will continue to reside in us. You know why? Because it doesn't need that temple of man. Luke 17, 21 2021 tells us the coming of the kingdom. One day, the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you. Other scripture says, within you. The kingdom of God is within you because you have God through the Holy Spirit residing within you. 
This is where we go to encounter God. Not some man-made structure. We come here to equip and learn to encounter God. But the Holy Spirit, if you've received God, resides within you. Jesus has given them a little sight adjustment. You see, the temple was, it was central to Jewish culture and faith. What happened was that building became more important than, than God who actually provided the building with, with, within which to worship Him. You see, Jesus had to adjust their worldview. The events of the coming days for these disciples, they were going to be so horrific. So horrific. Watching Jesus stand trial. Watching Him be tortured. Watching the crucifixion. If Jesus had not adjusted the scope on their rifle, adjusted their sight, they would have never, they would have never had the ability to maintain the resolve in their faith. And their faith was shaken. But Jesus was planting the seed through prophetic um, declaration. When Jesus says, not one stone shall be left upon another, he has prophesied that the temple would be destroyed. Now think about these disciples. You are looking at probably the most impressive archaeological uh, or architectural structure they've ever seen. It's pretty amazing. So when Jesus said, not one stone remains, they must have thought, uh, the pressure's getting to them. But see, they had not yet put on their God goggles. They were still looking at it from the natural. You see, without understanding what prophecy and the eternal perspectives that prophecy gives to you, offers to you as the gift through prophets and the gift of prophecy, prophecy, we all get caught up in these temporary monuments and moments in our life. We cling to man-made temples. We cling to, to traditions. Put on your God goggles and see the kingdom through spiritual eyes. Now I'm going to take us back. I'm going to take us back about 480 years. When Jesus says this, when he makes this prophetic declaration that the stones will not be rested upon one another, he is tapping back into Daniel, the book of Daniel, the prophecy. He is going back about 480 years into Old Testament prophecy. And what I'm going to read to you is this is the angel Gabriel, and, and he speaks to Daniel over 480 years before this day that Jesus is sitting out on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. This is the power of prophecy. And this is Gabriel's message about the anointed one. And this is Daniel. Right? I went on praying and confessing my sins and the sins of my people. He is interceding. This is the Daniel. Pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. This is an example for us. We have got to continue to pray, to confess, to repent, to intercede. As I was praying, Gabriel whom I had seen earlier in a vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. Look at that. This brother went into prayer, and the Lord sent an angel, a messenger, to explain to him. You know what's beautiful? We don't have to wait for Gabriel. We've got the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We've got immediate. The Holy Spirit searches the mysteries in the mind of God. We don't have to wait for an angel. We have the Holy Spirit, the advocate. He explained to me, um, Daniel, I've come to give you understanding and insight. The moment, listen, the moment you began praying, a command was given. Hmm. God hears your prayers. The moment you begin praying, I encourage you to stop being so safe in your prayers. The moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I'm here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and, and your holy city to finish their rebellion 
get your act right, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. This is Jesus. Now listen and understand, seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem unto a ruler. The command to build the, to rebuild the temple, you'll find that in Nehemiah, until a ruler, the anointed one, comes, that's Jesus, Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. I want to tell you, church, no matter what perilous times you're going through, God's Word remains as alive today as it did at the time that Gabriel showed up to speak to Daniel. It is vibrant. It is alive. Do not let these perilous times stop you from money, from grabbing up and grabbing the glory of God. Do not let it put you in a cage and satiate you as a tame lion for the kingdom. God's calling for wild lions, for wild lions in these perilous times. For after the the period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed. We're talking about Jesus' crucifixion 480 years ago or before that day. He's on the Mount of Olives, appearing to have accomplished nothing. Didn't they think Jesus accomplished nothing? You remember those two old boys on the road to Emmaus? Boo, who, who? We thought he was the one. Mm. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. I will tell you in 70 AD, the general, the Roman general Titus rose up to do what? He destroyed that city and he destroyed the temple. This is 480 years before Jesus is sitting on the mount. Then the end will come with a flood and a war and its miseries are decreed. And from that time to the very end. This scripture in Daniel is so deep. I wish we could spend a month in that one scripture. I encourage you to go back and read it in its entirety. But I want to make a point. The angel Gabriel told Daniel... There was a 490-year timeline, 70 sets of seven, from the temple restart to the destruction. Now, that day, that 490-year timeline, it began when Nehemiah received his order to restore the temple. You can read it for yourself in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. So from that time that he received, Nehemiah received the order from the king to restore the temple to the time that the anointed one came, that's Jesus, and was killed, crucified, to the day that Josephus, Josephus was a Jewish historian who was actually documenting the actions of of this Roman uh, destruction of Jerusalem to the day that the Josephus, the Jewish historian, sat and wrote, documenting the destruction of the city and the temple by the Roman general Titus? It's exactly 490 years. It is exactly 490 years. When I tell you That prophecy stretches your perspective. When I tell you that prophecy links back to Old Testament all the way to the beginning, uh, uh, to the, well, Revelation, um, the, the resurrection will be. It will be our beginning. I am telling you, you, there's an appreciation in the power of the prophetic word. We cannot discount and discard the Old Testament. I really do. I get so tired of hearing people say, well, that was the Old Testament. Hmm. So was Genesis 3.15 when God gave the first gospel proclamation of our salvation. You cannot, you cannot discount the Old Testament because you think it's an old book. Eternity is not old. It's forever. Without Jesus adjusting their perspective through prophecy, they would have simply enjoyed looking at a man-made building. And Ellie, I'm sorry I got caught up. And uh, if you want to come up, uh, but we're wrapping up. It is through God's commands, through the prophecies, through Jesus' teaching that we can put on God's goggles to avoid the rubble of the natural and grasp the glory of God's kingdom. I want to ask, what do you see? What do you see? Well, I will tell you, it depends. It depends on how you choose to look at it. How you choose to look at it. I'm encouraging you as we continue to march 
in the last week of Jesus' life is going to be some heavy prophecy. There's going to be a lot of Old Testament reference. I encourage you to come prayed up. To come prayed up. Come prepared to receive the significance of these prophetic words. Come during worship. Plug in to the, to the prophets. There are blessings. There's corrections. There's anointings. There are encouragements. There's words. God wants to stretch your eternal perspective. He wants you to see beyond that utility bill. He wants you to see that your bill for the sin of the world has been paid in full. He wants you to see. Like, I don't want us to be... I'll give you one example. Most of us are going to lunch right after this. I want you to just... I want you to ask yourself, what's the final bill going to be? Now listen, you get to pick the restaurant. You get to pick what you order. What's the final bill to the penny going to be? I will tell you that you don't know. I will tell you that you don't know. I want to put it in perspective. We can't even prophesy what's going to happen an hour from now that we have control over. If you don't see the fall down, flat face, reverence of the Lord, accuracy of prophecy, then we're really missing we're missing the power of God. Amen. Hmm. So if we can stand together as the body and, and, and allow me to pray us out. I want you to come into here with an awe for the Lord and come out of here with an awe for the Lord. And Oh, he's so good. Hmm. So I want to I make this invitation. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior... I encourage you to come today to make that decision. I, I respect that, that if, you, if you're not comfortable with, with a public proclamation, I encourage you to, to, to meet with our elders and they will explain and they will teach and they will, they will lead you in to receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the instant, whatever's quicker than an instant, you receive Christ as your Savior, you begin living your eternal life in what was prophesied. So, Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I, I pray a blessing over this body for blessing Leah and myself. It is truly, truly a blessing to be blessed by our brothers and sisters. Hmm. Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for allowing us to, to return to the gospel of Mark. I pray that this time that we continue to walk side by side, even as we sit on the Mount of Olives with Jesus and his disciples, yes. that, we, that we're not so enamored with the things of man, that we see the, the higher perspective, that we put on our God goggles, that we see that, that, that even in our resources are an opportunity to consecrate an offering to you as an opportunity to bless others. I pray that this body, that this body begins to, to roar with the boldness Amen. of an untamed lion Amen. in the kingdom. Amen. I pray, Lord, that, that they do not hesitate to, to grab your glory. Your glory was never meant to be meted out with an eyedropper. It is always depicted as a rushing, flowing, mighty river, a consuming holy fire. I pray that this body steps out of the religiosity and in to the true hunger for an encounter with you. Lord, we praise you. We praise you. Lord, I, I pray over tonight, 6 o'clock, I pray over Lisa Swartz as she comes to minister the Holy Spirit, the holy fire of the Lord. I pray an anointing over this, over this house as we continue through the day. Lord, we are so grateful. We praise you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.